right, welcome to the last session, the closing session. It's me again. It is my great honor to open and close the event this time. Uh, this session will be rather short. Uh, we just want to use the opportunity for some final announcement and some information around the event. And I think we're looking back to two days of very interesting content, a lot of interesting questions. So we are super, super happy uh, with the event. Um, it is a tradition at EclipseCon actually to on the in the closing session to present some interesting numbers around the conference. Uh, Mike Milinkovic usually does that at EclipseCon. He didn't do it this year, so I thought let's adapt that uh, for Theacon. Um, let's see. So what are interesting numbers for the last two days? Uh, I have four of them. Let's let's start small. Um, first, we are super happy number of participants. Um, so we have three hundred twenty. Uh, participants that's a very high number we are super satisfied with that so thank thank you to all the people who joined from all around the globe from different time zones uh, we're really glad to have you here and we, we really hope you enjoyed the event and um, this was a virtual event again although some uh, some of the major events returned to on-site uh, this year we decided to keep this event virtual um, which, of course, is missing a little bit the social factor, but it also has huge advantages because more people can join. We avoid traveling costs. And there's actually an interesting number, a rough calculation uh, based on the different countries that we have. If the event would have been hosted in Europe and all people uh, that were registered actually traveled there, um, we would have spent 2,000 tons uh, CO2. And we saved that actually by doing the event virtual. So I think that's an amazing number and it's also a good argument to, to keep this virtual, but we will see for, for next year, of course. Um, of course, it's not perfect. We still produce some carbon, um, for example, for coffee, because uh, everybody uses their own coffee machine instead of one big one. And a rough calculation, uh, no science behind that, but during the two, days uh, we probably spend around a quarter of a ton on uh, uh, carbon oxygen just for coffee which is actually a lot of uh, but nothing compared to the 2000 we saved so i think we're we're good on this event um and the final number that i would like to present is uh, this year we had the longest talk ever at theacon and surprisingly it wasn't one of the lightning talks given by paul yesterday it was actually planned for five minutes but apparently the system decided his talk is so great that it's scheduled it, uh, to run on for 12 hours straight. <laughs> so as you can see here, it was, was listed as 12 hours. All right, um, uh, two announcements before I want to thank a few people. Um, so for one last time, um, please consider to join our developer survey um, where we ask you some questions. Um, and of course the results will be shared in the report. So we really want, want to know what's what's going out uh, on there in the developer world. So it would be super great if you got answered that. Actually we're doing great. Uh, I think today already 100 uh, participants have completed that, which is a third. So thank you very much for that. But for the others, please take the time um, and, and tell us what you think. Um, and the second thing I would like to announce again, I mentioned that in the in my presentation yesterday uh, at the beginning of the conference, there will be a hackathon for Thea on December the 14th um, for until 6 p.m. Central European time. You can register on the Thea homepage. And that is a slot where you can actually learn how to contribute to Thea more on an organizational level, like you learn the whole process where we have to open PRs, uh, what you have to consider and so on. And there will be a couple of experienced Thea developers guiding you through your first PR. So definitely make sure to join there if you're interested. All right, and now I would like to thank a couple of uh, groups and people. So first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers. I think we have seen two days of really great content. So thank you so much for submitting your topics and giving these great presentations. It is worth mentioning that all the talks have been recorded and they will be um, published on the Eclipse Foundation YouTube channel. So watch out there. I think they will be uh, available next Monday, so uh, over a weekend, which is pretty fast. I also would like to thank the whole organization team. Um, this event is not <laughs> run, uh, run by a uh, AI, there are actually a lot of people behind the scenes that you don't see in a, in a virtual format that organize the stream, that do technical checks with the speakers, um, that do the marketing beforehand. Um, so a lot of people have worked on this. 
I would like to mention Serena, Clark, uh, Sarah, David, um, and a couple of more. I uh, cannot mention everybody, but thank you so much for making this a great event and everything went smoothly except my internet connection. And finally, I would like to thank the program committee. I cannot thank myself. So uh, I would like to, to shout out uh, to Hans Oecke, Gustafsson, and Colin Grant, um, who took the time to be on the program committee and look at all the submissions and uh, do a great selection of talks, which I really enjoyed uh, uh, yesterday and, and tomorrow. So thank you very much for, for your help and for your work on the program. And finally, last but not least, I would like to thank the sponsors of this event. So it is worth mentioning that this event is hosted by the Eclipse Foundation and sponsored also by the Eclipse Cloud Development uh, Tools Working Group, which is a consortium that uh, wants to strengthen the ecosystem around uh, cloud-based development tools at Eclipse. Um, and it is uh, sponsored by all its members. You see the list down there, the strategic members and the participating members. So thanks to this group and all the members of this group for basically providing the money that we need to host such events uh, for free. And with that, um, I um, would like to close Theacon 2022. Thank you all for attending. Enjoy your evening, day, or uh, morning or whatever the time zone is for you and hopefully see you uh, next year or earlier in the Thea event like the hackathon, the dev call uh, or on GitHub. Bye bye. Thea has brought the existence of an ecosystem, an open source framework that allows us to, uh, to be in the driver's seat. And by that I mean we have the freedom to devise our own ecosystem marketing strategy without being bound by conditions that are imposed by a third party. And that's very important for us. With Thea, um, the Eclipse ecosystem uh, started to provide a next generation platform for uh, tools and IDEs. And I think the big impact is that a lot of uh, projects that would have gone to other ecosystems finding a new platform are now um, considering the Eclipse ecosystem again as an innovative space to build tools and IDEs. Where I find that we're really good is the community perspective. We've managed to build up a community of very diverse uh, enterprises and individuals and I was personally surprised by the way that everyone came in saying I have very specific use cases and my problems are unique to myself and then we started sharing these problems and turns out we all have the same issues and we could work together to solve them and I found that beautiful. For me I think the biggest impact of Thea is providing the industry a vendor neutral tooling platform to build their developer tool products on top of. Um, so whether you're talking about Google Cloud Shell, talking about ARM's Embed Studio, uh, you can you can see where the industry is taking Thea and using it as we had hoped to actually build products that developers love. One of the biggest impacts it's had is quite technical. Uh, it's the ability to uh, create an IDE which you can deploy on the desktop or in the browser using exactly the same code base. Uh, we found that extremely powerful. Uh, we've actually got a situation now where we have products running in both those environments and we use the same code base for both. I'm a bit biased because I worked on it, um, but I think the memory inspector feature um, is very neat and really sets the uh, apart from some of its competitors. Um, we did a fair bit of research into competing solutions when we were making the new version of the memory inspector, um, and we tried to come up with something that was at least as good as everything else and had a little bit extra. Um, and I think we managed that. I think it's a very uh, attractive feature and I think it's got a lot of functionality that's pretty easy to access and use. For us, three aspects are essential. Firstly, I would say the, the extensive customizability, although in the core user interface is really important. And then the strategy of enabling both cloud-based applications and, and those that continue to run on the desktop. 
And what should not be underestimated too, in, in my opinion, is the fact that Visual Studio Code extensions can also be used under Eclipse VS. The VS Code extension support because I think that's been the driving yeah, feature behind a lot of adoption of Flare, simply because it's just so easy to get started with it. To me, the upcoming support and improved support for secondary windows, it might not sound like it, but I have multiple monitors and being able to pop out windows and use as much space as possible to, to, in, like, to make the, the workflow smoother, I would say, is to me a great feature of FIA. To me, the most important feature is, and probably ever will be, its customizability, going way beyond just uh, allowing you to add a logo uh, and styling on top of an existing tool, alongside maybe some custom behavior that you want to edit, but instead really enabling you to, to keep the generic tool behavior where it fits, uh, but also choose uh, the spots where you really want to take full control over the functionality. For me, as a, a developer, it's the flexibility. I mean, you can pretty much replace anything or do your own stuff, relief stuff out in Thea. And that just makes it a, a great platform for uh, uh, IDE-like tools that are not exactly mainstream. I would claim that the trend towards web-based and cloud-based tools is still in the very beginning. Um, and now that Thea um, is considered to be the next generation of the Eclipse platform, I would expect that more and more projects that are currently adopting the desktop Eclipse platform start to adopt Thea as the next generation technology uh, for the next, hopefully, two decades. Thea is really well on the way in becoming the standard choice for companies providing custom tools or uh, IDE-like products. So I think this will lead to an even broader and increasingly rich ecosystem of recurring components uh, that can be used in such products uh, and can be shared with other companies. And um, many of which uh, I think we already see today, such as the memory inspector, tracing support in CDT.cloud, or support for building diagram editors and modeling tools with uh, Eclipse GLSP and EMF.cloud. So I think there is already a great ecosystem, but I expect a lot of innovation uh, to happen in this ecosystem in the future, uh, the more adopters join and work together. I believe that we'll continue to add uh, features that, um, that our, our adopters request. For example, the toolbar uh, was new recently, uh, or right now we're working on adding support for moving some of the, the views outside of the main browser window. For example, right now there's a PR open for terminals that you can pull out of the, the main browser window. And uh, the second uh, focus would be that we make it easier for the adopters uh, who build products on, on Thea to work with both the community, but also with, with the releases. And for example, the, the community release that we started this process is a big step in, in that direction to make it easier to adopt new versions and uplift, etc. I would encourage anyone with an idea for an application that they'd like to develop to give it a try with Thea um, and make use of the community resources that Thea makes available. In the past five years, the various contributors have made a huge achievement that the community can really be proud of today. Many thanks for your work, and I look forward to being positively surprised in the future as well. Yeah, so I think the, the, the vibe and the collaboration across several companies and uh, working in different domains in Thea is excellent and truly inspiring, and I'm very happy to be part of that community. First and foremost, congratulations. You're doing a fantastic job. Um, it's uh, and you're f fulfilling uh, a real need in the industry. Um, so by all means, keep going uh, and congratulations.
Thea follows a monthly release um, cycle since its inception, which is great for driving innovation. Um, and with a community release, we actually add a second release cycle on top of this monthly release, um, which is called the community release, and we produce one every three months. The idea here is to focus more on stability and also make it easier for third-party technologies to integrate with Thea. So in contrast to a monthly release, a community release publishes a um, we release candidate one month ahead and we have a maintenance branch for this release which allows contributors and adopters to provide hot fixes and basically stabilize the, the, the release even more. Furthermore, uh, we have a list of technologies that integrate with a specific community release and publish a version that is already tested and compatible with, with this uh, community release. So in a nutshell, if you're an adopter of TIA um, and you don't necessarily want to adopt every monthly release for example, because of your project is already in a, in a more stable phase, then the community release is the way for you to go. I'm a bit biased because I worked on it, um, but I think the memory inspector feature um, is very neat and really sets the uh, part from some of its competitors. Um, we did a fair bit of research into competing solutions when we were making the new version of the Memory Inspector um, and we tried to come up with something that was at least as good as everything else and had a little bit extra um, and I think we managed that. I think it's a very uh, attractive feature and I think it's got a lot of functionality that's pretty easy to access and use. I would say it, it, it is uh, the, the collection of, uh, of a few features, really, that together makes the adoption of Thea much more easy. And one, one is the Thea blueprint, obviously. Uh, another one is the, the quite heavily extended documentation, which uh, has been a, a, a long need, a, an outstanding need for a long time. Uh, it's also the support of the Playwright uh, test framework and the improvement of the CLI, the command line interface. It wasn't necessarily a, a, a user visible feature, but at that time we, we worked a lot also under the hood. Um, for example, the integration of the, the Monaco editor, how we use the code from, from that project has changed a lot. And that makes it much easier to work with that code base. So we, we for example, when we want to work uh, to move to a new version of Monaco, it, the process has become much simpler. Um, and the second thing is we've done a lot of performance work. Um, for example, the performance of reading and, and writing large files has been improved by a factor of 10, not 10%, a factor of 10. So I'm pretty happy with that one. So it has to be for me via increased, improved support for VS Code extensions and the ability for application makers and users to consume them through the OpenVSH registry. Um, so you can either access the public instance to get your plugins from at openvsh.org, or you can even see to self-host uh, a registry yourself in order to host your own plugins and consume this in your applications. I'm really excited about the um, Memory Inspector, uh, which has come from Ericsson. Um, it's a, a very powerful um, sort of way that you can actually look at the memory on your devices or within your applications um, as you're debugging as well. Um, I think that's a great feature. That would be internationalization. Uh, so FIA has been heavily adopted all around the globe and adopters such as Arduino, for example, highly appreciate the great translation support. I see Thea is really as, as a kind of running the same playbook um, in, in terms of being open, providing an extensible platform that everybody can embrace and adopt um, in their in their products and in their in their offerings. And don't forget, Thea also runs in the cloud, so it's also service offerings. It's not just downloadable desktop IDE, um, but it's really recreating the success. Uh, of the Eclipse IDE in terms of you provide something that developers love, you make it an open and extensible platform that companies can adopt and use in their own products. And that combination um, is, or is, is a proven success.
Clear allows us to adapt every detail to the requirements of our users, including its core user interfaces, integration with external services such as device management, as well as custom editors for graphical languages where we were able to contribute a little bit. Or I expect the community release cycle of uh, Thea to be really a very important synchronization point uh, for multiple things for the Thea platform, for the industrial products that build on, on top of Thea, as well as for the ecosystem around Thea. This is my opinion, I'm going to push for this, but Thea is analogous to um, like an IKEA flat pack or a prefabricated house. And one thing that you always want to know is where your parts come from. We need to work on securing our supply chain. And this, the Eclipse Foundation already gave us a lot of um, a heads up on it and a lot of lead way. So we're good on that. Uh, Open VSX, which allows us to bring in additional plugins, needs to be a platform where we can secure the origin of the platforms and make sure that we have secure code, license compliant code, and, you know, just plain good code on it. So I think one of the, uh, the features I'd like to see is the ability to detach windows. Um, so multi-window support, um, the ability to sort of break out and have a, a multi-document interface really uh, within Thea, which I believe there's some work towards and proof of concepts around already. Thea has been able to be hosted online since its inception and we have done since quite a while. However, for managing the developer containers, you have to apply other frameworks or custom hosting solutions so far. And with Thea Cloud, the project now also started to provide a very lean hosting solution that is fully tailored on hosting the online. And I'm very much looking forward to this initiative. The thing that I would see uh, most uh, or m most likely to see in the in the near future is the uh, addition of the multi-window support, which is also called the detachable windows. Yes, hi community, <laughs> make yourself visible. So um, if you are interested in Thea, if you're evaluating it or if you're adopting it, uh, talk to us, uh, report issues you have, ask questions in the forum, join our weekly or weekly dev call, uh, post something on the mailing list. So the, the Thea team is really very open and we are super much interested in new use cases and to support our adopters. Yeah, and finally, if you're adopting Thea, add yourself to the to the website and become part of the Theo ecosystem. So it's been a long time coming to have this first community release of Thea. Congratulations to the team. Um, it, I know it's been a long journey for you folks, uh, but we're really happy to see uh, Thea produce this release and you know really laying the groundwork for future success. So, so, so congratulations to the community. Um, you're doing an awesome job. Keep it up. <laughs>